everyone, and welcome to Gruff Talk, where each week we take a deep dive into all the ways we can look better, feel better, live better, and age better. Today, my guest is one of the coolest guys I know, Mark McEwen, who is going to chat about all the celebs and politicians he's interviewed over the years when he was the co-host of CBS Morning Show. And more importantly, he's going to tell us about an event that almost killed him. I'm your host, Barbara Hannah Grufferman. Mark McEwen. What can I say about Mark McEwen? Not only is he an award-winning national TV journalist, best-selling author, good buddy of mine for over 30 years, and one of my husband's best friends since their very first day of college, an amazing husband and father, and just an all-around great guy, but he is a stroke survivor. And holy moly, he loves nagging people about what to do, what not to do to prevent stroke. And that's exactly why he's here with me today, because May is National Stroke Awareness Month. So we'll be talking about that and a heck of a lot more. Stay tuned. Oh, joining me today is my dear friend of, can you believe it? I think over 30 years now, right? Right. Forever. Is, right Forever. At least over 30 years. I remember the day I met you too is Mark McEwen. Mark, welcome to Gruff Talk. My pleasure. Hey, Barbara, how are you? I'm pretty darn good. <laughs> <laughs> Especially because I'm hanging with you for a while. Yeah. <laughs> Always Thank fun you. for me. Now, listen. I just said to everyone that I've known you for over 30 years, and it is because you've known my husband, Howard, for well over 30 years. And that's how I know you, because I married Howard, right? I met Howard the first day of college. (laughs) That's a way It's a story you both love telling. It's a story you just both love telling. It's so great. It was the first day of college. Wasn't even yep. like the first week, the first day. He had glasses like I thought John Lennon. <laughs> he had round glasses, and uh, uh, I didn't know him at first. And then we uh, we met, and slowly but surely, the ball got rolling, and he and I are ace buds. Yeah, <laughs> a long, long time. How long was his hair? Back then, his hair was long. Back then, it was long, Says right? The I mean, I've seen who photos. Has no but... hair. <laughs> <laughs> Barbara, I had an afro back then. His hair was down to his shoulders, maybe. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. A little reddish, curly. Yeah. 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 Yep. 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 That's why we now have one redhead, curly-headed redhead in the family, yeah. right? <laughs> who I've met. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. So, Mark, you know what? Everyone knows a lot about you, but why don't you just kind of give us a little tour, like down memory lane a little bit of what you have been doing for, you know, since your early days when you decided you want to be on the air. Tell us about that. Okay, here we go. Barbara, before that, I was a rock and roll DJ, Baltimore, Detroit, Chicago, New York. When I left Detroit to go to Chicago, I was replaced by a young DJ from Hartford, Connecticut. His name, Howard Stern. I've known (laughs) Howard forever. Okay. Then that Howard Stern, darn him. (laughs) You get fired a lot in radio. I didn't get fired before I got to New York, where I got fired twice. The second time, I was in the Daily News newspaper, and my executive producer turned to his wife and said, I think I found my weatherman. So they called me up. They knew I had left NEWFM, and the guy said, "Um, I'm one of the producers of this morning show. I thought, WCBS FM. I thought, that's an oldie station. I didn't want to play right, old news, Right, I listen I to it sometimes. <laughs> so I thought, you're lucky if you have one producer in the morning. Have producers? Okay. And then he says, we're going up against GMA and the Today Show. And I say, hold on. 
are you talking about television? He said, yes. Interested? Yeah. <laughs> so I, had, I went down mm-hmm. the black rock. The phone was blowing up. The guy who saw me is asking me, uh, are you a Mets fan or a Yankee fan? Do you have brothers and sisters? How long have you lived in New York? And I'm thinking, you're asking me dumb stuff. Found out he was sizing me up. Mm-hmm. And then he said, uh, uh, how do you feel about doing the weather? Truth was, Barbara, I could care less about the weather. <laughs> but when they ask you, you don't say no. I said, I could. He said, sure, you could. We'll get your meteorologist that will have one audition and do me a favor. Don't tell anybody about this. I said, okay. Went downstairs, told everyone. <laughs> <laughs> so the one audition was in a, um, a studio. That was packed. He said, I'm going to stand next to the uh, camera, talk to the camera. I used to do stand-up comedy. I always say I was so funny doing that, I ended up in news. That's how funny I was. So he (laughs) said, is there anything I can ask you that can lead you into your comedy? I said, ask me where I went on vacation recently. Okay, so he's talking, talking, talking. Then he says, where'd you go on vacation recently? And I say, Jamaica. Everyone in Jamaica has an accent. Where are you from, Mon? What's your name, Mon? How you doing, Mon? I said, even the dogs. Bark, bark, Mon. And everyone laughed. And I thought, (laughs) I think I got this job. That my first job in TV was on national TV. And that was... I was just glad to be there. Had no idea that people do their whole careers to get there. Yeah. So what was the name of the show, Mark? Uh, (laughs) That show was called uh, The Morning Program. And then Mm -hmm. that got canceled. They kept one person, me. Unbelievable. That show was called CBS This Morning. Right. Barbara, being a DJ... And I like research. I like knowing things. I was like, I'd like to interview people because the news anchors would get through people as fast as they could to get back to news guys. For me, I was like, is that B.B. King? (laughs) So (laughs) you could see when I finally began to ask people questions, they would cock their head and they'd say, you could see them thinking, a question about music. <laughs> how <laughs> nice. <laughs> and so that's how I began. Barbara, I covered the Grammys, the Oscars, the Golden Globes, the Country Music Awards. We covered three Winter Olympics, Alberville, Lillehammer, and Nagano in Japan, where I ran with the Olympic I'll tours. I'll never forget that. Oh, the Gruffermans were so proud. <laughs> <laughs> My daughter, you you met her, Maya. Maya was maybe two, three, four. And I was gone for two weeks. When I came back, she followed daddy from room to room to room. <laughs> <laughs> Don't leave, daddy. Oh, Don't my, leave. Maya was no. so cute. She was such a that cute little thing. Yeah. She's me. still a cutie. She's still a cutie. So how many presidents have you interviewed, Mark? U.S. Five, presidents. Uh-huh. Five, six, if you count Donald Trump, who I interviewed before he became president. All right. We'll include that. <laughs> <laughs> my guy, George H.W. Bush, my guy, who uh, proclaimed May as Stroke Awareness Month. Mm-hmm. Back when he did it, it meant nothing to me. Now it means a whole lot to me. Thank you for that segue into my next question. Mark, something happened to you a number of years ago that really did change your life. Yeah. What happened? Barbara, I had a stroke, and my stroke was bad. I was in a coma for two days, intensive care for a week, hospital for a month, learning how to rehab for a year. It changed my whole life. You had to relearn a lot of everything. things. Everything. Everything. Really I, everything. I had to learn to talk 
how to learn to walk. This hand, my I'm right handed, mm-hmm. it shakes. So I do everything. One day I was writing and it was squiggly and I thought, heck with this, I'll do it left handed. So I learned how to do everything left handed, mm-hmm. shaving, putting in contacts, eating, drinking, the whole thing. Again, it's something I didn't think I would do. If you told me, I'm not. But it was something I had to do. And uh, I want people, I always say you don't hear lucky and stroke in the same sentence. I'm lucky. Because there are people who've had a stroke, their arms are drooped up, their faces are down, they're in wheelchairs. Barbara, I speak around the country. Uh, And when I say to the person who brought me, I'll be right back. I go over to where the stroke survivors are. Barbara, it's like coming home. It's like coming home. I hug them because my neighbor didn't have a stroke. My cousin didn't have a stroke. My co-worker didn't have a stroke. I did. So when they say I'm in rehab, I'll say, what kind? Then we talk about rehab. I'll tell them mine. I always tell them, don't give up. Don't give up. Hope is a very, very powerful emotion. Barbara, I'll be honest. I used to hear and read about things happening to other people, and then it came and got me. And you want the world to stop because you have, it doesn't work that way. Off it goes. I'm like, hey, hey. So, here but, you I know, am. when you go around the country and you give these talks, which you do frequently, you are so inspiring to these people who have experienced stroke, are in the throes of possibly, you know, going through rehab, and even the families and the loved ones of people who have had stroke, who are there to be supportive and to learn more. And, you know, what's of great interest to me and to a lot of people listening right now is how to prevent stroke and the signs of stroke and what kind of lifestyle habits should we be embracing right now? Again, most of my listeners are in midlife. Hopefully a lot of them have been embracing all of these healthy habits throughout their lives, but you know, maybe not. <laughs> but what can we all be doing right now? What have you learned? Okay. And what do you share with your audience when you're talking what about I've that? What I've learned by Mark McKeown. <laughs> Barbara, it's been 18 years since my stroke. I'm lucky. People don't know I've had one. I know. <laughs> but I've lost 50 pounds. I exercise on a regular basis. Exercise doesn't mean joining a gym. Just go for a walk. Out there, uh, walking raises the heart level, makes the heart stronger. And again, you don't have to walk 10 miles. Walk to the end of the the, the driveway. Then walk to the end of the street. Then walk around the block. And when you get outside, outside is fun. You hear birds chirping. Cars go by, you say hi to people and all that. And uh, um, don't worry about being slow because you're on a mission. You're on a mission to get healthy. Barbara, pretty much vegetarian. I'll eat chicken every now and again. I'll eat fish every now and again. I never was a steak guy. I don't really miss like a meatloaf and all that. But I'll say this, everything in moderation, including moderation. (laughs) The key for me is if you can't remember when you had chocolate chip cookies, have some. The key there is some, and then go back to being on your uh, uh, best behavior. Barbara, if you have told me I could never eat chocolate chip cookies again. I would have eaten every one. (laughs) So you can alter your lifestyle, but make it so it's not a burden. Make it so it helps and works for you. Barbara, I go to the Publix grocery store 
I see people smoking. Mm-hmm. I see people yep. who are overweight. Yeah. I see, and I say to myself, that's not good. That's not that's good. That's not good. And so uh, you have to take care of yourself because as you get older, you have to make the odds work in your favor. And that helps the odds work in your favor. Yeah, you know, there's something that's uh, a, a term that's being bandied about a lot lately, and it's called exercise snacks. And what you just described is kind of like an exercise snack where you just go out to your driveway or around your block. It's like a small amount of time. But if you do that several times during the day, or maybe go down on the floor and do 10 push-ups and or a couple right. of squats, and then go about your business and go about your day, and then maybe do it again, do a plank and take another walk, walk your dog, whatever it is you do, you don't have to spend, as you pointed out, a lot of time. You don't have to go to a gym. You don't have to spend a lot of money. You just probably need a good pair of running shoes or sneakers that will be comfortable and and supportive enough. So when you are doing all of these exercise snacks, you'll be comfortable. Yep. And also eating. (laughs) So, so important. My equilibrium is messed up. The first time I laid flat and tried to do a sit-up, I thought I was having another stroke. You can't do that. I can't do that. So you know, what do you uh, mean by uh, that? You mean you, you get dizzy? I get dizzy, my oh. yeah, the whole thing. Really? As they say, the whole Megilla. Huh. And uh so what I do is walking and I go to a gym. When I go to the gym, I don't do the uh, weights and all that. I just walk on a treadmill. And I listen to music uh, with headphones, uh, Zeppelin and Journey. <laughs> Classic and rock. That's that. what I do when I'm running. Right, right. <laughs> Classic rock. Uh, it just gets great. Yeah, you have to make the odds work in your favor. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And what have you learned? Like, what was the most important lesson that you learned, do you think, from all of this? I mean, you mentioned eating well. You mentioned, of course, exercising, moving your body, I think, is the way we really like to talk about it. So it doesn't sound like, oh, they're pushing exercise down my throat, right? It's just keep moving your body, and it'll all be good. It'll be such a positive impact. But like, what else? I mean, you had the support of your wife and your family, and your friends, and other loved ones, and of course, the whole community who watched you for years, or listened to you for years on radio. So you had that also, right? Uh, You know, Barbara, I used to be able to eat a whole pepperoni, extra large pizza by myself. (laughs) Can't do that. Can't do that. Not Mm. to say you can't eat pizza, but again... Once in a while. What I've learned is, Barbara, when I was younger, comic books, remember them, at the back of one, it said, would you rather be rich? And they showed a guy in bed with a butler, so rich, but he couldn't get out of bed, or be poor and be able to dance a jig down the lawn. (laughs) Guess what? As you get older, your health is more important. If you can't get up and can't move around, what good is getting older? Again, you can be as rich as King Midas and can't move. So what I've learned is take care of yourself. Take care of yourself. Right. Don't give up. But as you get older, take care of yourself. And I'm not going to lie to you. (laughs) Barbara, getting older is something that happens to all of us. (laughs) I like to say, if we're lucky. Yes, if we're lucky. Mm -hmm. If we're lucky. Not everyone gets that blessing of getting older. I always say, this beats the alternative. Mm -hmm. The alternative is. (laughs) Bye-bye. <laughs> so I didn't know, actually didn't know this, or maybe it didn't, I forgot, which is very possible. I didn't realize that uh, George H.W. Bush was the one who made May or pronounced May 
to be National Stroke Awareness Month, which is what we're in right now, which is one of right. the reasons you and I said, hey, let's have this conversation now to kind of promote stroke awareness and prevention as well. So I didn't know that. So yay, yay. I'll, I'll tell you a story. Um, I met him, interviewed him four times. He has my number. I had his number. I went back to CBS. Harry Smith came down to Florida to interview me with the camera crew. Yes, and I remember I that. And I could barely talk. I could barely move. And uh, the producer said, would you come up when we run it? I said, New York? No. He said, please, please. Okay, okay, okay. So I flew. It's one thing to go to Des Moines, Iowa. <laughs> it's another thing to go to New York. So I go to New York. I sat there, hugged the whole studio people, uh, crew and all that. Harry said, there's a lot of tears here. I'll put the Kleenex right next to you. Barbara, I cried through the whole thing. And I said, I hadn't heard stroke survivors. I said stroke victims. When I first gave my first speech, the head of the National Stroke Association very gently said, we say stroke survivors. I never heard that before. But when I went there and talked to Harry, as I'm getting out of the studio to go home to the hotel, the phone rings. It's him. And he says, I saw that. You sound great. You look great. I thought, you look you That is blush. so wonderful. <laughs> That's a great story. For him to proclaim May Stroke Awareness Month, as I said earlier, mm -hmm. meant nothing to me. At that time. Mm -hmm. 1989, I think it was. Now it means the world to me. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was him. That was him. Mm -hmm. Hey, Mark, I have to, I'm switching gears just a very little bit. I would love to know, and maybe you can't answer this because then it's definitely showing favoritism on your part, but did you have that one interview that you've done over the years that was just like, okay, that's it. I'm done. That was the best interview I ever did. Best interview I ever had. I can't ever, like, it can't be better than this. Just, I have to stop now. I, I'm curious. <laughs> and if so, I'll give you what a was couple. it? Barbara, I interviewed everyone. Every, you did. 16 years is a long, long time. Denzel Washington, um, he, the night he won his second Oscar was the night they gave the second Oscar to Sidney Poitier. And so he was like, uh, uh, Ju Julia Roberts was there. I know her. And uh, she knew Denzel because they were in a movie together. I can't remember what it was right now. But afterwards, we had a booth. He comes back. He has the Oscar right on his lap. And he says, we're talking, and he says, I need a new angle. And I say new angle. He says, people have been saying for years, I should have won the Oscar for this. I should have won the Oscar for that. He holds up the Oscar and he says, I need a new angle. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. That's great. You've really had so many amazing interviews. I uh, mean, we watched you every day and they were just really, really great. And also, great. you know, when you did those interviews at the various events, like you know, at the Oscars or at the Grammys and just amazing. You are, Barbara. as I've often said, Mark, you are one of the greatest interviewers of our time. A master oh, interviewer. Oh, 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 now you wrote you. a book. You wrote a book after your experience yeah. with stroke, which I highly recommend. And in fact, there will be a link to the book in the show notes. So everyone, okay. you know, and also on my website when this airs, and uh, so people can check it out. But then you've also been writing another book about, right. you know, less about your experience with stroke and more about your experience interviewing all these incredible people. It's been kind of both. Mm -hmm. It's that, 
the people, uh, Denzel, David Bowie, Bush, Garth Brooks, Joni Mitchell, James T- Taylor, Stevie Wonder, all kinds of people. And then it's, uh, in it is what I've learned after having a stroke. Mm-hmm. That is not the stroke experience then. It's what happened afterwards. Mm -hmm. And uh, Barbara, it's been a long uh, journey, long, uh, well-learned, learned journey. But I have to tell you, one thing that meant the world to me, my book was written with a ghostwriter, Dan Paisner. And I was in bad shape back then, bad shape. He would uh, uh, interview me, and I would answer, and then he would send me the manuscript, and he said, change it uh, however you want. When he wrote about Tony Bennett, he wrote about him like People Magazine would. Uh, Tony's my buddy. In that tone. (laughs) Mm -hmm. I said, I'll write Tony, I'll write Garth, I'll write my father, and don't you change a word of it. Okay, when I write a blog, when I set the blog, your it's blog on is Facebook. great, by the way. Thank you, thank you. And read by a lot of people. He said the words to me that meant so much. He said, "You don't need no stinking ghostwriter." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hear which that is amazing. From- like you're, uh, you're like a triple threat. Is that the term? Like you're, you're so cute <laughs> and a great guy. <laughs> But you're a great interviewer and you're a great writer. So like, wow. And by the way, I just want to share with you that right now, my dog, a lot of people know who listen that Pete, my Brittany dog, is very often in the, no, always in the room with me (laughs) when I do this podcast. And normally it's at a time of day where he's like, had this big walk. He's had this, he's like, cool, he's sleeping. But it's right now, it's around his dinner time, and he's like an alarm clock, and he's sitting there, and he's like staring at me. Right. <laughs> How old is he now? It's so funny. He just turned 10. Aloha. He just turned 10. What? I know. It's, it's so 14. crazy. I'm sorry to interrupt your story. But anyway, yeah, you're a great writer. Your blog gets a lot of comments on social media because I, I see it. I read it. You're really, really good. And so I'm looking forward to seeing this next book. It'll Thank be really, you. really Thank fun. You, you know, you didn't answer my question, Mark. Like, who was that? Is. Who was that best interview? Barbara, and you don't have, listen, if it's going to hurt feelings out there, then. <laughs> no, no. Um, my <laughs> answer is they were all good. Mm-hmm. They were just, I like talking to big people. And everyday people, yeah. just the same. The fun for me is getting people to talk, getting them to think. I always say, do your homework, because I'll give you an example. TV, Barbara, is full of people who are pretty and dumb as a bag of rocks. They write their <laughs> 10 questions, and they say, Brad Pitt sits, sits down, and they say, tell me about your latest project. Right. And he says, you know, on the way over here, I got an AK-47 and shot up a 7-Eleven. And they say, is it a comedy or a musical? <laughs> Their answer <laughs> to the first question can negate all the other questions. If you've done your homework, now you play ping pong. goes back and forth. And I try to make it not a forward brow kind of interview, a conversation. Yeah. If that's what I aspire to. And so I tell people, forget the cameras, forget the lights, talk to me. And so, uh, you know, and I try, my mom always said, be sweet, be nice. I try to be nice. Yeah. Oh, definitely you are. I mean, you know, you're, you're not looking, you're not looking for the tears to come down. (laughs) Barbara, I'm looking at my wall, Sting, John Travolta, Bruce Springsteen, Hillary. George Harrison, Joni, Beyonce. Amazing. <laughs> Sylvester Stallone, Celine Dion, Muhammad Ali, Neil Diamond, Jack Nicholson, Michael Jordan, Richard Pryor, goes on and on. Amazing. Really, so fun. So fun. fun. Did you ever feel like, you know, you were in 
either giving a talk or interviewing someone and you messed up and you said, oh my God, I can't believe I just did that. I will never be able to show my, did that ever happen to you or, cause you're so smooth. Barbara, I always say there's no one harder on me than me. And so I think, God. I shouldn't have said that. And people oh, yeah, go, but that's what? maybe being like critiquing yourself. But did you ever actually mess up where you're like, uh-oh, this uh, is yes. not good? No, okay. right? You never had that experience, did you? The hardest interview I did was mm-hmm. Tommy Lee Jones. Tommy mm. Lee Jones at the time was in The Client, the movie by yeah. Grisham. Uh, Susan Sarandon, all that. He also went to Harvard and roomed with Al Gore. I thought, that's great. Didn't know he didn't want to talk about that. He's kind of a a curmudgeon anyway. Mm -hmm. When I brought up Al Gore, it turned into, yep, nope, yep, nope. I can't go home with yeps and nopes. So I say, what's it like being in a movie written by Grisham about a book that everyone has read. He says, I don't know. I thought, okay, give me one book that will touch you. Uh, I don't know. I'll give me one. Okay, Huck Finn. Why? Barbara, his answer was pure poetry. Oh. Uh, he talked about this. He talked about that, what it meant to him, what it meant when he read that. I thought, I'm good. Thank you very much. That's the exact thing I was saying about how you are really a master interviewer because you, without skipping a beat, you just kind of very gently and kindly without getting defensive about the fact that he wasn't giving you any answers except one syllable answers. Yeah. And you turn that around. Yeah. Good. Yay. Yay, Mark. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, I love it. Barbara. The key for me is getting people to tell you something, to talk about things. And I remember when I first began, I first was interviewing, they gave you, the producer would give you a packet. A packet is how old they are, what they've done, what they're doing now, where they live. And on the packet was an index card of suggested questions. But I wouldn't ask them this. And Tony Moranti, my guy, my former stage manager, manager said, ask them what you want to ask them. I said, you can do that? He said, yeah. So from then on, I would take their suggested question, put them to the side. I write my questions. And then I look and see, did I miss anything? And Barbara, 9.5 out of 10, I rarely did. Rarely did. Yep. That's great. And you, on the other hand, you don't like to know what you are going to be asked. I mean, this is not the no. first time that I've, quote unquote, it, if you want to call this an interview, I feel it's a conversation, but it's not the first time that we've had this kind of exchange. And you never want to know what is going to be asked of you. And I know you tell this to other people as well. Yep. Yeah. If I know, you start thinking of things in your head, the correct way to say things, I say your answers are more real for me when I don't know what's coming. It's fun. And it's fun. Again, if it's something I don't want to answer, I'll say that. But for the most part, don't tell me. Don't tell me. (laughs) You get real answers then. Yeah. All right. So, Mark, you know, National Stroke Awareness Month, you know, also want to put in that word prevention. You know, I know the month is not called that, but I want to add it in anyway. I think everyone needs to listen to your words of wisdom here and move your body, just eat everything in moderation. I think that was really well said. I mean, if you can have a chocolate chip cookie, ugh. That's not the way to go, really, (laughs) right? None of that really works. It's like not sustainable. Right. In fact, a new study just came out this week from the American Heart Association about how the very restrictive diets like keto, 
or paleo well, I saw that. are not, I saw a, that. not sustainable, right? You saw that too. And they mm -hmm. really aren't good for your heart. In fact, the contrary, right. you know, the ones that really are the ones we know well too, the Mediterranean diet and the very famous DASH diet, those really do work. And that's just like, that's like common sense eating. So I encourage everyone to think about how they eat and maybe just make a few subtle changes, everything in moderation. And also, I really believe keeping stress at bay as best as possible is really important for your heart health, which is, um, you know, connected to stroke, of course. We, we know that. I mean, it can be. And sleep, I think, should be a priority. And anything else? Like what... What are like some of the things you want to make sure that everyone remembers from our conversation today, Mark? Barbara, Ben and Jerry's, <laughs> <laughs> you can't have it every day. <laughs> Barbara, it's pretty gosh darn good. But you have to, like I say, everything in moderation. Yeah. And you want, as you get older... I see uh, people, I always say they walk like penguins. <laughs> I see people who uh, are, are not taking care of the, themselves. Yeah. Uh, again, you have to take care of yourself. And again, moderation, moderation. Moderation. And also I'd like to add in, you know, get those checkups. Get those checkups, yep. especially when you're yep. in midlife and beyond. And yep. make sure that your blood pressure is what it should be. Make sure that your cholesterol levels are what they should be. And if they're not, make the lifestyle changes. And if you need medication, take the medication and be compliant. Yep. Do not if that's going to help you, right? Yep. yep. Barbara, I take Eloquist. <laughs> we talked about this. I uh, mm -hmm. take it every day. If I, I rarely miss taking it. If I do, oh no, I haven't taken my eloquence. Sure. But for everyone listening in, so they know, although most people I think know what it is, eloquence is a type of blood thinner. Right. Atrial fibrillation. Right. To help you from developing blood clots, so which right. can easily lead to a stroke right. or, and an aneurysm. So, you know, that that's what it's for. So you, ever since your stroke, you've been on Eliquis. Is that right? Barbara I was Warfarin at first, mm -hmm. and then I launched Eliquis. I was the host for that in Chicago. Right. You were part of the launch of Eliquis. Right. Yes. Uh, I was on stage, Barbara. They had a teleprompter up here. And the teleprompter in front of the stage, they would ask me questions from my book, and the answers would be from my book. But I've learned if you're tied to a teleprompter, you're tied to a teleprompter. So what I would did, I maybe did one sentence and stop reading that and just talk to them. And that there were eight thousand people in the audience, including the CEO of Pfizer and the CEO of Bristol Myers Squibb. And I said, I have to say this. I said to them, it's people like you who help people like me. And the place went nuts <laughs> because they don't hear that enough. No, but no, no, no. Most me. people like they to bash the pharmaceutical like companies. But right, right. Getting back to what we were saying before, I'm a big believer in if you can make all the lifestyle changes that you can to maybe fix some of your health issues like blood pressure yeah. or cholesterol, whatever yeah. it is. But if at the end of the day, maybe because of genetic reasons or whatever, that you will be helped by a medication, take the medication. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> take the medication. Exactly. We want to see everyone age better and uh, do, <laughs> do whatever you need to do, everyone. Correct? You know, Barbara, there are people who go, I'm not taking it. Mm -hmm. I'm a man. Mm -hmm. Heck with all that. You're right. Take the medication. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mark, 
I love you. This has been I fun as always. I and mean, we hit on some very serious topics here, but some fun ones too. I hope you'll come back. Barbara, always, always. And you, my friend, are a great interviewer. Mm, I have a lot to learn, Mark. And, you know, maybe you and I should have like a little offline tutorial <laughs> <laughs> on how to be. I'll never be a master interviewer, but how to be a better interviewer. I mean, everybody can always get better, right? Yeah. Right. right. <laughs> but thank you. I'll take the compliment. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Tell Howard and Sarah and Elizabeth, I send my love. I will indeed. And to your family too. And everyone, we will have all the links to Mark and the book and everything else that you need to know in the show notes and on my website. So Mark, thank you. You'll come back soon, and I will be talking to you soon, of course. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you, Barbara. Bye-bye. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. If you enjoyed this episode of Rough Talk, please do two things. First, share it with all your friends and family, and subscribe to Gruff Talk wherever you listen to podcasts, including YouTube, so you never miss a single episode. Until next time, remember this. We can't control getting older, but we can control how we do it. Talk to you soon. Age Better Podcast is a proud member of the Sound Advice Network. Sound Advice, Women's Voices Amplified.